Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're glad that you're with us on this Transfiguration Sunday, which is the end of Epiphany and the beginning of Lent. So this coming Wednesday, we start our Ash Wednesday service at noon, actually, with the drive through ashes, if you want to do that during the day from 12 to 1, and our service is at 7 o'clock that evening. Going forward, each week we'll have a soup supper at 6 and the service at 7. Uh, we probably ought to explain all this wine up front this morning. So, <laughs> No, we give you thanks for celebrating with us and sharing in that ministry of our Holy Communion and bringing the wine as we will bless those shortly. The flowers today are given by Judy Stewie in honor of family February birthdays. This has been a week, hasn't it, brothers and sisters? Uh, we pray for the MSU community. We pray for those students we know. We have at least two from this congregation, Katie, and I think the Webbs have a grandson that's there. And we all have connections. Our son attended there and went classes to classes in that building. So uh, please keep all of them in your prayers as they travel back today uh, to try to start school back up and uh, some sort of normalcy uh, for all of them, as well as for the, the five that are still recovering. Um, so let us have a prayer of blessing over the wine. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for these gifts, the fruit of the vine that we use as we celebrate the body and blood of our Son and the communion that we share in each week. For those who have given, for those who will partake of that, we give thanks and pray your blessing over these gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us rise for the confession. <clears throat> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world that you so love, forgive us that we may be reconciled to one another for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thus says our God, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. We sing our gathering hymn. <laughs> our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. 
For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen and amen. Let us pray. O God, in the transfiguration of your Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the witness of Moses and Elijah, and in the voice from the bright cloud declaring Jesus, your beloved Son, you foreshadowed our adoption as your children. Make us heirs with Christ of your glory, and bring us to enjoy its fullness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Our first reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 24, beginning at the 12th verse. At Mount Sinai, Moses experienced the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. The glory of the Lord settled on the mountain, and on the seventh day, God called out to Moses. On the mountain, God gave Moses the stone tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord. Please read responsibly with me Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why do the people mutter empty threats? Let us break their yoke, they say. Let us cast off their bonds from us. Then in wrath God speaks to them, and in rage fills them with terror. What are you guys reading? <laughs> You have a different psalm? Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, that my ways were made so direct that I might keep your statutes. I will thank you with a true heart when I have learned your righteous judgments. You shall crush them with an iron rod and shall shatter them, shatter them like a piece of pottery. And not only things to be lies, when you are rulers of the earth. Submit to the Lord with fear and with trembling bow and worship. Bless the Lord the name of the Lord, and 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 the Lord, starting um, with first chapter, starting with the 16th verse. At the transfiguration, God's voice was heard, declaring Jesus to be the beloved Son. By the activity of the Holy Spirit, God's voice continues to be heard through the word of Scripture. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, 
This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were here, while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will. But men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The word of the Lord. gospel according to Matthew the 17th chapter Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him then Peter said to Jesus Lord it is good for us to be here if you wish I will make three dwellings here one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision, until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Our guests may be seated. Have the children come forward at this time? We got one brave one today, so good morning. So did you guess the right color? No? Yeah? <laughs> it was going to be green. They were talking in Sunday school about what color I would wear today because we're switching from Epiphany, which was green, to Transfiguration Sunday, which is white, and next Sunday is going to be what? Purple. <laughs> you got it. So we start Lent next week. So do you like roller coasters? No? Kind of? I love roller coasters. The best part of the roller coaster for me is when you get up to the top and you're right up here and what's going to happen next? You're going to go down really fast. And then you come back up again, and you go to the top. If you go to Cedar Point, one of the biggest roller coasters there is the Magnum. That's one of my favorites. You go up to the top, and you look out, and you can see Canada, all kind of places, and the water, because you're like up almost on a mountain, up really high. But then you go down, right? <laughs> and you come back up, and you go down, and come back up. Sometimes you go around like this, too, and then you get sick, you know. <laughs> but then you can get more food, so it's all good. They plan on that at Cedar Point, so... Uh, that mountaintop experience, that's what we're talking about with Jesus today. He went up to the mountain with the disciples, and something really special happened there. He's transfigured, which means he turned, like, brilliant white, which was, like, really weird for the disciples. But what it meant was God was saying he approved of what he was doing. And he said, you're my beloved. And then he said to the disciples, listen to him. Those three little words we kind of miss out, listen to him. That's what we're supposed to do all the time, but transfiguration reminds us about that. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us, for showing us the way to follow you, for giving us a glimpse of the glory that is ours to come. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Have a good day. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the coming Christ. So this week's gospel does bring us to the end of the Epiphany season, and it is a very strange gospel reading. It defies interpretation, even though the commentators have tried to explain it over the years. It's a story of a mystical encounter, not only between God and God's beloved Son, 
but also between those who were along, Peter, James, and John, and us who get to see it from a distance many years out. And those at the center are Jesus and Moses and Elijah. And I always wondered, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? Did they have little name tags on and said, hello, my name is? But I digress. I'm not sure where we got this idea, but it seems to dominate the way most folks read the Bible. Give us a passage and we'll put on our thinking caps and we'll read between the lines and we'll come up with the hidden, encoded message that is in that passage. And this idea seems to be that the story itself is just a carrier for the real meaning that's inside. And if you figure out the content, then you can pull that real meaning out and you can place it on a shelf where you don't have to bother with it anymore. Most commentators and theologians decoded message in this passage is that Moses represents the law, Elijah the prophets. Jesus, of course, is God's Messiah that was promised and foretold in both. And by singling out Jesus as the beloved, they say that God has set the gospel above the law and the prophets. Listen to him, the voice from the cloud says. And there's two secondary meanings as well. One about how it's better to keep your mouth shut in the presence of the holy rather than blurt things out like Peter does. Well, let's build three tents. What was that about? Or about the purpose of such mountaintop experiences is to strengthen us for the climb back down into the valley where the real work begins. And for all we know, those might be exactly the messages that Jesus and Luke or God meant for us to get from this weird account. But it's also important to note that the passage itself doesn't really say any of those things. Rather, it just simply describes something so beyond human experience that most of us are pretty content to just hold this one at arm's length. But this morning, I want you to imagine with me for the next few moments what it would have been like if we had been there on that mountaintop. It might have sounded like this. It started with a line climb up a windy mountain in the fading light of the day. Jesus was anxious and overworked. He wanted us to get away from the crowds. He wanted us three disciples to go with him. He was hunting for a place to pray. No talking for once, no pleas for healing, no picnic lunches, just breathing and solitude. And solitude, by the way, is one of the things Jesus never got much of. Still that way for you? Sit down, he pleaded. You're here to pray, so get on with it. Pray until you're weighed down with sleep. Pray until it's dark enough to see the light through your eyelids where light should not be. And you really don't want to open your eyes to see where this sudden light is coming from. You do, but you don't. It's a mixture of curiosity and fear and dread and excitement, and it causes you to look. And there he is, someone you thought you knew really well, standing there pulsating with brightness. Light is leaking everywhere. His face is like a flame. The clothes are dazzling white. And as if that weren't enough, two other people are there with him. They just suddenly appear. Who are they? Can it be Moses and Elijah? Somehow you know dead men come back to life and God's own glory lighting up the night. Peter starts mumbling something about tents. We need tents, he blurts out. Tents! Now there's a cloud that's coming in fast and furious, way faster than any weather front. It's a terrifying cloud. It seems alive. It cuts Peter off. It covers everything. It smells like lightning. We can't see our hand in front of our faces. And then a voice, a voice that lifts the hairs on the back of your neck, booms out. Listen to him! Listen to him. This Jesus, we have left everything to follow. He is shining. 
And then it's over. As suddenly as it began. Silence. If anything even remotely like this has happened to you, then you understand how relieved Peter and James and John must have been when Jesus told them, going down the mountain, don't tell anyone about this until after I'm raised from the dead. And they're probably so shocked by this experience that they probably missed the part of that admonition. Some of us are allowed at least one direct experience with God, something that knocks us for a loop, something that blows our circuits, certainly calls our certainties into questions. We call those God moments or epiphanies. I've had a few over the years. I first came in seminary. I had come out of the final for our Old Testament class. I'm not good at the Old Testament. I had a solid C average in that class, a D going into the final. And I took the final, and I thought, it's done. Time to work at McDonald's. <laughs> so I went into the chapel to pray, because the chapel was open during the week, and the chapel at Trinity Seminary is this old German-styled chapel with beautiful stained glass windows that they brought over from Germany, and I sat. And I prayed, and I said, Lord, you drug me this far what in the world do you want me to do next? And I heard one word. Trust. That's all I heard. I got a C by one point on that final. And here I am today, almost 40 years later. These are the things that are supposed to make you believe, but sometimes they make you question all the more. You have your Christian decoder ring. You get in baptism, right? It's supposed to help you figure all those things out. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen that way. And what if, what if, brothers and sisters, the whole Bible is less a book of certainties than more a book of encounters with the holy, with the awesome presence of God that intersects our lives? What if it's more about this staggeringly long parade of people who run into God and each other and life and they're never the same again? After all, what don't we see in the Bible? Not just terrifying clouds and hair-raising voices, but also crazy relatives and persistent infidelity and constant conflict and armed enemies and deep depression and life-saving strangers and miraculous children and food in the wilderness and amazing love. Amazing love. I think Peter and the other two disciples sensed that. When Jesus was lit up before them, they knew, they knew that they were experiencing a mountaintop moment. The Bible calls it God's glory, that shining cloud that is the sure sign of God's presence. And Peter may not have known what he was saying, but his instincts were good. He knew that he was in the presence of the presence. He knew that God was right there. He knew that tent or no tent, he was standing as close as he was ever going to get to the kind of meeting that really matters. So today is the day for us Jesus followers to look down at our maps and realize that it's time to turn away from the twinkling stars of Christmas toward the deep wilderness of Lent. And as gloomy as that may sound, it's good news. Most of us are so distracted by our gadgets, so busy with our work and school, so addicted to our hobbies and pleasures, so resistant to what we can learn in the valley that a nice long spell in the wilderness might be just what we need. No one can make you go, but if you've been looking for some excuse to head to your mountaintop and pray, then this is it. If you've been looking for some way to trade your old certainties for a new thing, then look no further. This is your chance to enter the cloud of unknowing and listen. And listen for whatever it is that God has to say to you. And tent or no tent, this is your chance to encounter God's glory. 
But be assured that no one goes up the mountain alone. Sometimes things get a little scary, as they did for us this past week, before they get holy. But above all, it tells us that there is something standing in the center of that cloud with us shining so brightly that you might never be able to wrap your arms around it. But He is the one who is worth listening to because He is God's beloved. And so are you. So are you. Amen. Please rise as you're able as we confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Embolden your church as it witnesses to the majesty and mercy of your Son. Equip lay preachers and deacons and pastors. Move us to share our stories of your faithfulness and forgiveness. May our lives proclaim your greatness. Merciful God. Draw with your whole creation from the tallest mountain peak to the deepest valley. Bless the work of conversation and organizations that protect vital habitats. Support the work of disaster relief agencies around the world. Merciful God. Guide and give wisdom to all in authority. Our mayors, our local leaders, our governors, our state legislators, our president, and national legislators. Bring freedom and justice to all nations. Merciful God. Give shelter to those lacking safe homes. Spur communities to work for fair housing for all. Protect our neighbors whose dwellings do not keep out dangerous cold or heat. Accompany with your touch those who are homebound sick, isolated, or grieving, especially Jim, Tom, Donna, Juliana, David, Amy, Ryan, Pastor Sarah, Pastor Hank, St. John Dundee, Pastor Janice Locke, 
A confirmation class, Aubrey, Braden, Carson, Claire, Juliet, Michael, and Lamar. And all those struggling with COVID-19 all over the world. The people of Ukraine and those in Turkey and Syria. The students and staff of Michigan State. The students returning today and those recovering. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Make us eager to receive your word in the scripture. Help us recognize Jesus' voice in the needs of our neighbors. Make us confident to follow the way of the cross. Merciful God. Receive our thanksgiving for the holy ones who have guided us in faithfulness and gathered even the unlikely as your people. With our forebears in faith and all who have hoped in you, teach us to wait with courage until the promised day dawns. Merciful God. We bring to you our hopes and needs, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. We share the peace or a sign of the peace.
I think you need to hear that last line one more time. This is my Father's world. Let us not forget that though the wrong seems off so wrong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king. Let heaven ring. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who sharing our life lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to your own brilliant light. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. which was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. We feast on God's meal of love for us together. You may be seated.
Congregation, please rise. Let us pray. Holy One, we thank you for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, to love kindness, and to journey humbly with you. Amen. Now may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Serve the Lord.